you. So we've got to sing loud and uh, let the Lord, Lord know that we're still here and, uh, and that we are here to worship Him. So let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day of worship, a day where we can gather together with our Christian friends and worship you in, in unity. And you tell us, Lord, that where three or more of us are gathered, that you are in our, our midst. And so we thank you for your presence here, Lord. We just ask that you would be with our service this morning, be with our worship leader and those who are in our worship team, that they can sing full of joy and full of worship for you. We love you and that we uh, want to uh, lift, lift your name on high. And Lord, we know that uh, even though we are here, there are many that are at home sick, uh, some with uh, mental problems, some with physical problems. And so Lord, we just ask that you would heal those as we lift their names up to you. Lord, we do ask again for healing for those whose names we have lifted up to you. And you know what their needs are, Lord, so we don't need to tell you that, but just to ask that you would heal them in your point of need. And Lord, we now lift up to you the prayer that your Son Jesus Christ taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now if you would stand, we will worship our Lord through our music. Hallelujah. Good morning. This is the day of the Lord where His mercy and grace is available. I just want to share to you one of the verses in the Bible. It's in Revelation 22, verse 14. It says, Verse 16, rather. I, Jesus, sorry, 40, blessed are those who wash their robes, what they may have the right to the tree of life, and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexual immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent an angel, my angel, to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and offspring of David in the bright morning star. Amen. God is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. And we all need to be intentional, even in your worship. Yes? For we believe that when He comes, we are all faithful in doing His will. Yes? If you say so, say it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Say it again. Yeah, yeah. Say it again. Yeah, yeah. Say it again. Yeah, yeah. I'm trading my sorrow to you. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying it down for joy.
identity just comes from you, O oh God, and we are your sons and daughters.
就是在 High Land Park 的啊康复中心啊康复中心为老人院所做的施工啊，是这个是这个活动是每一个月的第二个星期天，时间是一点半到两点半。Uh, if you are interested, please talk with uh, Pastor, uh, Pastor Dallas. Uh, Pastor, uh, please talk with Pastor uh, to ask for the details. Uh, uh, next one is Homeless Ministry, March the 13th, 2019. Meets the second Wednesday of each month at 5.30 p.m. at the Union Rescue Mission in downtown Los Angeles. Contact Master of for details. 第二件事是为无家可归之人所做的施工，时间是啊三月十三号，二零一九年。这个是每个月的第二个星期三，在啊 downtown 的联合救援会，时间是五点半钟，请大家跟 Master Daniel 联系。Our next one is Wednesday Spanish Bible Study. We have already one. Master Lee, Sir Lies. Uh, yeah. uh, Wednesday, Wednesday is 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. in the Frank Chan Fellowship Hall. Come out for fellowship and spiritual learning. Spanish and English speakers are welcome. 第三件事就是星期三举行的啊，西班牙语的查经。呃，时间是每周的星期三下午的七点到八点半，在我们的当牧师联谊厅举行，请大家一起过来，讲英文的和讲西班牙语的都欢迎。那 next one is Thursday English Bible Study. Thursdays 7 p.m. to 8:30 p.m. in the Frank Chan Fellowship Hall. Come out for fellowship and spiritual learning. Spanish and Mandarin speakers are welcome. 啊，第三件事，呃，第下面一件事就是星期四每周四的英文查经活动，时间是七点到八点半，在我们的啊账目失联一厅举行。啊，请大家，嗯，都欢迎参加讲英文、讲中、讲中文的，啊，讲西班牙文的都欢迎参加。啊，啊 ，Next one is Friday Chinese Bible Study. Fridays, six thirty to nine. Here in the Frank Chan Fellowship Hall, dinner will be served. Chinese and English speakers are welcome, and also Spanish speakers. You can learn Mandarin. Ah, uh, next, uh, next one is the Friday Chinese Bible study. Time is from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Every day, there are Chinese food and Mandarin food for dinner. Ah, talk about Chinese and English food. Ah, welcome to the Friday Chinese Bible study. Ah, next one is the Friday Chinese Bible study. Ah, welcome to the Friday Chinese Bible study. Uh, next one is the board meeting, March 17th, 2019. Our next meeting is March 17th from 12.30 p.m. to 2, 2 p.m. in the Frank Chan Fellowship Hall. All are welcome to attend. 下面一件事是三月十七号举行的啊董事会会议，时间是十二点半到两点钟，在招募师联谊厅举行。所有的兄弟姊妹都欢迎参加。Uh, now, next one is Latin Ecumenical Dinner and Prayer, March 24th, 2019. Our church is hosting Lantern, Lantern Dinner and Prayer at 6 p.m. in the Frank Chan Fellowship Hall. More details forthcoming. 下面一件事就是全球四旬节的晚餐和祷告会，时间是三月二十四号。呃，我们教会这一次呃主持呃赐训节的祷告会和晚餐，时间是晚上六点，二十四号晚上六点，在我们的张牧师联谊厅举行。啊、呃，我们会在后面的呃呃后面的时候会告诉大家更多的细节。那 next one is the fifth Sunday thing, March the uh, March the 31st,、uh, 2019, 5 p.m. Disciples of Christ, the fifth, the fifth Sunday scene is being held at the East Vita Christian Church, uh, 9,951 miles away, Whittier, uh, California, uh, 90604. Uh, 第五届演唱会的举行的地点在 East Whittier 啊、呃、基督教会
呃，地点是九千九百五十一号 Miles Avenue， 啊 ，Miles Avenue， 地点啊 ，California。Uh, next one is the Agape boxes. Agape boxes are located in the rear of the church for your tithes and offerings. Thank you immensely for your giving. 最后一件事就是我们的奉献箱，奉献箱安装在我们的大堂的两侧以及中间的门上面，请大家及时把自己的奉献投入到里面。非常感谢大家的奉献。啊、uh, ，Let's go to welcome to uh, welcome our first time visitors. Let's acknowledge our first time visitors. Now, if you are the first time, first time with us this morning, please stand and tell us your name and who invited you. Now, if you are the first time come here, we're so glad uh, to know you. First time visitors, ah, uh, 请在我们下面欢迎我们第一次到我们教会来参加的啊兄弟姊妹。我们非常高兴你来我们教会。我们想知道你的名字。然后也请你告诉我是谁邀请你来的。OK， I see a gentleman. Hello. Uh, hello, we are sister. Uh, uh, my wife's uh, mother is uh, the first time to hear, and uh, he also is a member of his mother. Uh, my name is uh, Ri Tai, and uh, this is the first time to see how to run a sister.
Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to South Texas Education Church. Welcome. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Welcome. Praise the Lord. Welcome. Praise the Lord. Welcome this morning. We're going to be reading from uh, Matthew chapter 25, verses 19 to 21. Mateo, capítulo 25, versículos 19 a 21. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to first read in English. Uh, Matthew 25, 19 to 21. Uh, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. So his, ma his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now I'm going to read in Spanish. Después de mucho tiempo vino el Señor de aquellos servos y arregló cuentas con ellos. Y llegando el que había recibido cinco talentos, trajo otros cinco talentos, diciendo, Señor, cinco talentos me has entregado, me entregaste. Aquí tienes, he ganado otros cinco talentos sobre ellos. Y, y, y su Señor le dijo, bien, bueno, cerro y fiel. Sobre poco ha sido fiel, sobre mucho uh, te pondré entre en el gozo del Señor. May the Lord bless the hearing and the reading of this word. Amen. Amen.
excited about the words that the Lord has given me uh, for you this morning. But first, I want to start by acknowledging our visitor um, all the way from China, the uncle, uh, uh, Captain Ben. Uh, thank you for visiting with us. Uh, I see him back there. Yes, God bless you, sir. Uh, God bless all of you for being here this morning on the first day of the spring back calendar, or spring forward uh, calendar. Uh, yeah, the fall back, right? We're springing forward now. Uh, as you all know, this may be the last time we have to do this. Mm -hmm. Apparently, there's some legislation out there that um, uh, if it's successful, we will not fall back. And we will have longer days from here on out. Now, they say the, problem, the only protest to that is that uh, while we have longer days, the mornings are dark. And, and, and that's a challenge for little kids uh, trying to make it to school. So um, that's important. Uh, it's crazy enough in daylight for kids uh, walking to school. It would be even more dangerous if they have to walk at night. So we'll have to see how that all works out some pluses and minuses to uh, both deals. Uh, as you all know, today is the first Sunday of Lent. Uh, last Wednesday, you should have gotten your ash uh, on your forehead. We did not have an ash Wednesday and Thursday in our service this year, uh, but uh, we hope that uh, in spirit you are uh, recognizing that this is a time for the next 40 days excluding Sundays, that we prepare our hearts uh, and examine our hearts uh, for, in light of the resurrection. Um, you know, resurrection, this time of year, is a time of renewal, uh, new beginnings, it's a time of self-examination, a time of uh, reevaluating your priorities in life, making sure that uh, what's important, what's really important is a uh, priority for you. And as we consider this important time where we begin to prepare ourselves for the resurrection um, over these next 40 days, I want you to also consider an interesting paradox that concerns our God, the God we serve. Now, although he is certainly worthy of the world stage and is bigger figuratively and literally than anything in the world, he does not always occupy the world stage. This awesome God, the creator of all that was created, nothing was created without him says we are the sinner, we are the apple of his eye, and yet oftentimes you don't find God in the biggest churches, wealthiest churches, you don't find God uh, at the largest or most popular gatherings, and you may not hear his voice amongst the loudest voices. I'm sure most of us are familiar with the story of Elijah, where God said, Elijah, I'm going to speak to you. And so Elijah prepared himself, and there was this mighty, powerful wind. But the Lord was not in the wind. And it says there was a powerful, earth-shattering earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then there was a fire. Consuming fire, and God was not in the fire. God was a gentle whisper. I believe a you know, those times we can strain almost to hear him. And so, as we see, as we will see, I want to show you in our text today, sometimes God is found in the most humble and seemingly insignificant things of life. And that is particularly apropos as we prepare our hearts for resurrection. Would you bow your head with me and let us pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for waking us up this morning, <clears throat> putting a desire on our hearts to come into your house and hear your word. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for all of our family that is here this morning. 
the opportunities we've had to fellowship with them. But now, Lord, we pray that you would set aside anything that would distract us from hearing your word, and that we may receive it, that it may take hold, take root in our hearts, and produce a hundred for return to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen. 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 And amen. Saints, God is always looking, the Bible tells us, God is always looking for people who are willing to trust him with a little. We live in a world where people expect instantaneous gratification. We have a microwave mentality that says we need to have it right now. It's always interesting to me that when you, uh, and this is true of my kids, you're gonna, you're gonna prepare something in the microwave, but even that's too long for them, right? Sometimes we go, we eat out because, you know, we need it now, right? And so that's this pervasive mentality that's in the world. You know, gone are those days where people were willing to start at the bottom and work their way up the corporate ladder. It's like now we want everything that we want and we want it yesterday. And 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 so it takes it's, it's taken us into a, a dimension, into a, a space of living where uh, we expect our our needs, our wants to be gratified instantly. We don't want to work, we don't want to persevere. Now it takes uh, if, if something takes too long for us to achieve, right, many people will become discouraged and they will give up. I imagine that here it is now in March, if some of us have started this year out with some uh, resolutions that we expected to uh, uh, live out and already maybe we've given up on some of those resolutions. Uh, but our text today, will show us unequivocally that God is still rewarding faithfulness. I need to apologize because somehow or another, uh, from my desk to the program, the, the scriptures uh, that I wanted to have read, we stopped a little short. I wanted you to go all the way to 24, but we'll take a look at that. Uh, I'm sure it was, I didn't, I didn't somehow or another, I mixed that up. But we're looking at the story today of the three servants who received talent from the Lord. And we're going to learn a very, very important lesson about faithfulness as we consider uh, that parable. Now, one of the most formidable challenges to remaining faithful to God is the temptation to despise humble or small beginnings. It's, it's easy to despise small beginnings, isn't it? Small beginnings come with a hard work and no help, usually. Right? Small beginnings usually come with um, much pushback and, and, and no encouragement. Small beginnings usually have very limited budgets, right? And, and many setbacks. It's easy to despise all of the work that goes into starting something and being content with a small beginning. But we have to be careful that when God calls us to something, that we're able to recognize his hand in it, no matter how things may seem. It would be easy to remain faithful and committed to God if the ministry that he calls us to start or the career that he called he he uh, puts on our heart, or the business that we start, it would be easy to be faithful to God in those things if they took off immediately, right? If overnight they became successes. But how many of you know that anything worthwhile in this world takes time, it takes investment, and we have to be willing to stick with it? You have to have the faith to keep on doing something even when it seems that it is not working out. And I don't know who the Lord, the 
this message is for, you know, sometimes the Lord gives me a message and, 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 and I know maybe a couple of applications, but I'm always surprised at how a message resonates in the hearts of the hearers. And so I know somebody here this morning needs to understand the value and the importance of a, of, of a small beginning, a humble beginning. It may not seem like anything that you're doing, may not seem like the thing that you've been called to do is working out, but even still you persevere in it knowing that you will see what God told you you would see. God is up to something. The Bible tells us in Zechariah that he rejoices when we begin the work and we don't despise a humble beginning. Now it's important that we see something that God wants us to understand in this text today. And I believe that if you don't hear anything else from this text today, then you would hear that God will never trust you with more until you have proven that you can be trusted with what you have. God's never going to bless you and trust you with more if you haven't proven that you can be trusted with what you have. So many people are stuck in life and they haven't been able to move forward because they haven't understood the importance of appreciating where you are now and what you have now. I'm often reminded of my experiences growing up. Uh, I remember in, as a young man getting a job that, that I really, really wanted and, and started off being so excited to work on this job and it wouldn't be long before all that has changed. And now, uh, whereas before I was early, first one there and the last one to leave, all of a sudden I'm the last one there and the first one to leave. All of a sudden I'm no longer uh, uh, have my enthusiasm and, and, and wouldn't be long before something happened and I'm on my next job, right? And that process continued over and over again. But God will never trust you with more until you have proved that you appreciate, that you appreciate what you have. So I have a question for you this morning. Now here's the question. Do you have the faith to stay committed even when it does not look like what you are doing is working out or working out to your favor. Until you develop the faith that allows you to persevere through the tough times and the difficult times, you will never experience what God has for you on the other side. Can I say that again? Until you can develop the kind of faith that allows you to persevere through the tough times, through the building days, to the stage where you're laying the foundation. You know, oftentimes before you erect the building, you have to go down. And it's during that time where you're going down that people become discouraged when you're laying that foundation. The, and the longer it takes to lay the foundation, the taller the building. Do you have the faith to persevere through the building years, through the difficult times, even when it doesn't seem like your work is fruitful, when it doesn't seem like anything's coming out of it? Can you persevere and get to the other side? Until we can do that, we're never going to see the wonderful thing that God has for us. So often we quit just before we would have had the success that God intended that we should have. So, how will you answer that question? Can you persevere through the difficult times? Sometimes we want to be promoted. But we aren't committed to the work that it will take to be promoted. And when the Lord gave me that, I knew, just as has been the case, there wouldn't be a lot of amen right there. <laughs> but nevertheless, it is true. Sometimes we want promotion. We want God to give us more. And we haven't proven to God 
God that we appreciate that we can even handle what he has already given us. All promotion comes from God. Do you believe that? It is God who promotes us. In Proverbs 75, verses 6 and 7, we're told that no one from the east, from the west, or the desert can exalt themselves. It is God who judges. He brings one down and he exalts another. And God will never exalt us. God will never give us more, trust us with more until we have proven we can be trusted with what we have. The Bible is full of examples where God has blessed his children after they have persevered through the difficult times. You all remember the story of Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery before and was faithful in that before God raised him to second in command in all of Egypt. David started out as a sheep herder uh, in, the, in the fields for his father before God blessed him and honored him to be the king of all Israel. And Nehemiah was called to the humble work of rebuilding the walls that surrounded Jerusalem. And out of that, God blessed him to become governor. When we are willing to persevere through the difficult times, the times where we don't have a lot of support, we may have limited budgets, and there may be much, much pushback from the people around us. If we can endure those difficult times, God has something for us on the other side. God is preparing us to take us to a new dimension. But we have to be willing to persevere. In verse 19 of our text, we read that it was a long time before the master of the house returned. Our text says that the man, uh, our text says that after a long time, the master of those were servants returned and settled accounts with him. Sometimes the things that God calls us to don't happen overnight. And we have to be willing to persevere through those difficult times. I would imagine that over this long period, that those servants had uh, the talents from their master. There were many occasions where they could have lost focus and maybe not have been as diligent as two of the three were. And I wanted us to read the experience of both. The one who turned the five talents into another five and the one who turned the two talents into another uh, two talents for us to get the full import of how pleased the master was with them when he saw their faithfulness and their diligence. It's easy to start off strong, and oftentimes we do that. We start off very, very strong, we're enthusiastic, we're energetic, but it's much more difficult to finish strong. And I believe that's why Paul tells us over in 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 through 8, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only me, but also to all who have longed for his appearance. And I believe another way of understanding that, but also to all who also finish the race, who fight the good fight. Now usually we should all start off with good intentions, right? We have great intentions at the start, but the trials and the tribulations come and we become discouraged. And so really quickly this morning, what I'd like to do is show you how your faith can be hindered how your faithfulness can be hindered through the experience of that third servant who received the one talent. And I think it's important for us to know in advance the things that are going to come that will hinder our faithfulness. Because let me tell you, anything that you commit to for the Lord, know that the temptation to give up is going to be ever-present. 
Because God is, first of all, using those trials and those tribulations to strengthen you. And, of course, the enemy wants those trials and tribulations to discourage you and cause you to stop. The trials and the tribulations are coming. <coughs> we start off in ministry. We're excited to serve the Lord. And the trials, uh, the everyday tribulations come and, and, and excuses. And finally, we find ourselves no longer serving the Lord. Not only in the capacity that he called us to, but without the enthusiasm as well. And so what do we need to be mindful of if we're going to remain faithful and committed to the things that God puts in our charge? And we'll see through the experience of this third servant a few things that we want to note and, and, and be aware of. First of all, from the experience of the third servant who received the one town, we can see that he knew what to do, but he failed to do it. Look at verse 24 in our text. It reads as follows. The man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I know that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered. He knew what to do. Later, Jesus says that very thing. You knew what to do, and yet you still didn't do it. You should have invested my money, but you knew what I required, and you still didn't do it. Can I share something with you, saints? And this applies to every single one of us sitting here today. What God expects from you is more fruit. What God expects from each and every one of us gathered here this morning is more fruit. Not more legalism, not more uh, dog, uh, dogmatic uh, uh, doctrinal positions, not more judgmentalism. What God requires from each and every person gathered here this morning is more fruit. I want you to see that for yourself in the text. Turn to John. I'm not going to have you turn anyplace else but back to our text, but I want you to turn there because you need to, to see this. What God requires of us is more fruit. And so the question becomes, how do we increase? How do we, how do we increase our fruit? How do we experience more fruit in our lives? And we're told in no uncertain terms here in John, Chapter 15. I'm going to jump around, so it may be hard to put it up, but if you can, go ahead. In John 15, I want to read the first two verses. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that does not bear fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Then verses 9 through 13, uh, 12, he says, As the Father has loved me, and really this whole chapter is about us producing more fruit. How do you produce more fruit? Let's read chapter 15 of John. We're, we're going to jump around to the key parts. In, in verse 9, he says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I kept my Father's <coughs> commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. And verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. So that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. When we come before the Lord on judgment, that is what he will be interested in from his children. Those who have confessed him as Lord, believed in their heart that he died for their sins, and he said, therefore you shall be saved. That group of people, 
the sheep, not the goats, the sheep, you, when you come before him on judgment day, he's going to shake you like a tree to see that your fruit falls and the fruit that he will be looking for begins with love. I'm often amazed at the things that we think define us as Christians. We think it's how we dress, what we do, what we don't do, whether we do that or whether we go here, whether we like these people or like those. It all comes down to loving everybody the way Jesus loves you. And you can't exclude sinners from that category because you are a sinner. I am a sinner. And Jesus loved me while I was yet in that sin. What defines you as a believer, what God's going to look for on judgment day, because you're saved. You, if you have faith that Jesus is who he says he is and has done what he says he has done, you are saved. And Jesus says, now therefore follow me so that I can mold you and shape you and prune you and groom you to represent the love, the image, to be the image of the love that he is to you. And so just like the servant with one town knew what God required of him, you now know what God requires of you. Will you bury it? Or will you begin to express love? And listen, you don't know you have the love of Jesus until you can love someone who's not like you. Easy to love your mother, your brother, your sister, your kids, your husband, your wife. Easy to love those folks sometimes. But it's hard to love somebody who doesn't dress like you. They don't look like you. They don't talk like you. They don't want what you want. That's how we emulate the love that Jesus is to us. My clock done. He took my clock down. Praise God. The second thing I want you to see, and I'll move really quickly, is that this servant with the one talent, uh, fear of failure stopped him in his tracks. Look at verse 25a back in our text. In 25a, we read that, so I was afraid, this is that servant with one talent speaking to the master. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. I was afraid. Now listen, saying fear comes to do one of three things in your life. First of all, fear comes to say, run! Get out of here! Right? Isn't that the initial feeling we have when we're afraid we want to run? I remember I went with the kids a few years ago, it was many years ago, to a Knoxbury Farm or something, to a, to a scary house for Halloween. And uh, we're walking through this, this haunted house. I've got the kids and my ex-wife, right? I'm the man, right? We're going through this haunted house. Well, I believe this was the first year where they started using real people in the exhibits. Right? <laughs> right? And so I'm thinking it's a dummy or something. And, and we walk past this thing and it reaches out and grabs me. And see, I, I, if I could have, I would have jumped out of the building. Okay? I mean, that's how much it scared me. That's what fear does. Our initial reaction is we want to run. We want to get away. So first fear comes and says, Run! Get out of here! You, you're coming to do the Lord's business. Fear pops his head up and says, Run! Get out of here! In, 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 in many of our relationships, isn't that what we do? We run rather than deal with whatever we have to deal with. And if fear can't get you to run, fear then will say, Compromise then. God said, Go straight. Fear comes to say, Go to the right. Go to the left. Don't make a compromise. Fear can't get us to run. It says make a compromise. Don't do it exactly the way God said do it. Do it this way. Do it that way. Take a detour. And oftentimes fear will cause us to detour and not do what we know we should have done. And it's all because we've been motivated by fear. We change things. We change what we were going to originally do or originally say. And it's out of fear. Fear of retribution. But fear can't get you to run. If fear can't get you compromised, the last thing fear has in its uh, artillery is to say, stop then. Stop for a moment. Think about this. What are you doing? Stop. 
And oftentimes that comes disguised as, as, as legitimate consideration for what's in front of us. When God says, go, go, don't stop, go. But we stop and we say, wow, well, wait a minute, maybe I do, maybe I should consider, maybe I shouldn't. And, and, and we find ourselves immobile. Of no effect. So many believers have become immobile. Aren't moving forward, aren't moving backwards, they're just, we're, we're stuck. And it's not a fear, perhaps the fear of failure oftentimes. The fear that if we can't do it perfectly, why even do it, right? And so here we are, stop. Fear wants you to run, wants you to compromise, or wants you to stop, wants you to become immobile. And we saw that with this survey. And the third and final thing, and I have no idea where I'm at on time. Maybe that was a little late. I hope it's not too late, though. The last thing I want to share with you is we see in the experience of this servant is that he's blamed Jesus for his mistake. He said, Lord, I, I didn't do it because of you. I, I didn't do it because of you. How many people are going to come before God and blame him for their failure? Lord, if, if I had just been born a little taller, if I had just been born a little shorter, if I had just been born to different parents in a different ge geographical location, a million and one excuses about, about, about why we bury what God gave us rather than use it and multiply it to his glory. So we see in the experience of the servant with one town. He knew what to do, but he didn't do it. We see that failure, his fear of failure stopped him in his tracks. And we see finally that he blamed others. In this case, he blamed Jesus for his mistakes. Those are the three things that can hinder us in our faithfulness to the call that God has placed in our lives. Are you in the day of small beginnings? Is there something that you have just started out on for the Lord? Maybe it's something in your career. Maybe it's a ministry in the church. Maybe it's something uh, as it pertains to your family. If you are in the day of small beginnings, take heart. Take heart in the fact that he who calls you is faithful. He is faithful to strengthen your hand so that you will not fall. He is faithful to help you overcome any problem that you may face. He is faithful to help you to overcome whatever the enemy may send your way in terms of trials and tribulations. He is able to encourage you. He's faithful to encourage you by his spirit and by his word. And he is faithful to provide for you through all of his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And finally, saints, he is faithful to lead you to victory if you will not fail and press on to the prize. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord in the house of God. Give him praise in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.